This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Hi, everybody. Hi, welcome to the London Theatre Seminar. Um, I'm delighted to present tonight um, Leslie Hill and Helen Paris, who are associate professors at Stanford in California and also the artistic directors of Curious Theatre Company. Um, I'm Jen Parker Starbeck, and along with Louise Owen and Darren Smith, we welcome you to London Theatre Seminar tonight. Um, Leslie and Helen have, have passed out a few things. We didn't have enough for everybody, but they are their show, Best Before End, is going to be at um, uh, the Chelsea Theatre this month, 26, 27, and 28. So book your tickets now. And they're also here to discuss ideas about their forthcoming book, which we've passed out a flyer um, about as well, called Performing Proximity. We're so delighted to have you guys here. And I think what we're going to do is, is leave it to them for about 40, 30 or 40 minutes. And then we'll take a break, have a little wine, and then have a discussion, question and answers. And then um, we'll all afterwards retire to a local pub for a little bit more conversation, if you'd like. Um, as we speak, I'm going to pass around our, let's see, where did it Sorry. go? You already had it? Circulating the register sign-in sheet, so if you'd like more information about London Theatre Seminar in the future, and also just so we have a record of, of how many people and who is here, if you can just sign that as it comes around. Okay, great. Thank you all for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Jen, and thank you, and Theron and Louise for having us. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for coming. It's just so bloody nice to be back in <laughs> sort of the, the UK theatre community. It's a community that I am so proud of, so proud that I have had a, a part in, and uh, I have been homesick for. I think that the, sort of the students and the um, professors and the sort of the live art performance theatre scene here is so important and the work you're doing so I am just really grateful to be here we are doing 20 minutes each so I promised you it's going to be 40 minutes and and Get we're out the yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so as, as Janice said we have a book coming out this summer so I thought and hoped it might be fun to talk about some of the ideas from that so um, I'm going to set up uh, notions of proximity um, first and then over to the <coughs> Um, okay, so as, uh, as part of the project on performance and proximity, Helen and I reconsidered some of the concepts of proximity within uh, contemporary performance studies. And we were drawn on the work of anthropologist Edward Paul, um, whose 1966 book, The Hidden Dimension, introduced the science of proximity. And the handout that I've passed around is um, our own drawing of his sort of proximate zone model. Um, so this is still widely cited across many disciplines in relation to the norms of, let me see if I can, yeah. <laughs> That's easier, easier to see you both. The norms of physical proximity between people in different cultural in, and interpersonal contexts. So Paul's model of proximics uh, draws upon Heidi Heidegger's work, not the other Heidegger's, but Heidi Heidegger's <laughs> work on territorial behavior in animals. And it looks at the distances between people in terms of public, social, personal, and intimate space. So part of Hall's contribution to anthropology lay in recognizing the central importance of sensory factors beyond the visual in human perceptions of space and spacing. So Hall's animals have much in common with Heidegger, uh, Hall's humans have much in common with Heidegger's animals in their use of multi-sensory cues to negotiate territory and maintain personal space. Personal space is Heidegger's term for the normal spacing patterns that members of a like species maintain between themselves. Uh, this personal space exists as an invisible bubble around each organism, with dominant animals having larger bubbles than submissive ones. Likewise, dominant humans um, such as public figures, are accorded larger bubbles. So the more important a person is in your culture, the less likely you are to be physically near them. Um, for Hall, the realization of the self as we know it is intimately associated with the process of making boundaries explicit. These boundaries are defined both by somatic sensory information and by 
psychologically and physiologically internalized but often unconscious cultural norms. Okay, so um, with this model, I'm going to work from the outside in. So starting at the outside edge of public space, and then I'll zoom in towards intimate space as we go. So public distance far phase for Hall is a distance of 25 feet or more, with a parameter of 30 feet being the distance automatically set around important public figures. Um, and Hall illustrates this concept of this proximity zone with two examples in his book. It's the 60s, so the public figure he chooses is Kennedy. And he talks about the day after Kennedy becomes the Democratic Party nominee, suddenly he has a 30-foot personal space. That's now his personal space uh, because he may be the next president of the United States. So people who would have been friends or colleagues and could have been a lot closer now have to wait at the outside edge of this invisible boundary. And the, the other example he gives is um, that of an actor um, because actors in proscenium arch theaters are almost always at least 30 feet from the audience. So um, he talks about the, the actor, by virtue of their training, knows that at 30 feet or more, the audience can't read the voice, expressions, the face, in the way that they would be able to in personal or social space, and so they have to compensate for that through their skill and their training. So the example from the outside in is one of social deference, and the example from the inside out, from the actor's point of view, is one of specialist training and skills. So actors have sort of a unique cultural role in relation to space in that they must frequently adjust for distance by modifying behavior in order to create the illusion of being closer than they really are. So to continue a little bit further with this Kennedy actor pairing, um, if we take, for example, the Ike Theater at the Kennedy Center, that's sort of a medium or to large size venue. It's the smallest one in the Kennedy Center. It seats 1,100 people. So in a venue this size, um, an audience is never really going to get closer than 25 feet to the actors, and they may be 10 times this far from them. Um, So the actor's job of bringing intimate moments to life for the audience involves a learned ability to connect with people across the physical chasms of theater architecture. Most of the actor's work is done in the no man's land of what Hall, with almost humorous simplicity, calls officially not close. Um, so beyond the 25 foot threshold of this, this edge of the far face of public space, um, not close isn't so much a zone in Hall's proxemic model as it is everything that lies outside the zone. So from 30 or 40 feet to outer space is all counts as not close. Um, so outside the radius of these, these rings of the proxemic zones, naturalistic expressions, voice, and movement are impossible for audiences to interpret with anything like the precision with which humans can read each other at closer distances. And much of what we think of as theater acting can be seen as an art form developed in response to a type of architecture, the, feature, the fixed feature space of theaters. So as artists, the theater shapes us as much as we shape the theater. The cavernous size of theater buildings has always been a challenge for actors, many of whom prefer smaller houses, but also for writers and directors who aim to convey situations and emotions in their work in closer focus modes. Um, writers and performers a hundred years ago felt many of the same push-pull conflicts experienced today between the artistic and financial demands of the theater. Um, Strindberg, who was the leading figure in naturalism, of course, uh, said he longed to escape from grandiose Victorian theater architecture. If, first and foremost, we could have a small stage and a small house, then perhaps a new dramatic art might arise. Uh, moving closer in, uh, for Hall, social distance occurs in its close phase between 4 to 7 feet and in its far phase between 7 to 12 feet. Uh, so both close and far phase social distance is frequently used in the workplace, um, with close phase more common in social gatherings. And at this distance, people can use a normal rather than a raised speaking tone, and people's faces still appear round, whereas in public space, 
features flatten um, and they appear less expressive. Uh, in social space, people are just out of reach of each other, but they could pass an object. They stretch towards each other. Uh, in more intimate theaters like the Donmar or the black box spaces of many experimental theaters, a significant number of the audience will be seated within social distance from the performers, enabling them to receive a more finely tuned sort of oral and visual stimuli. Um, moving further in personal space in Paul's classification system is about one and a half feet in its close phase and four feet in its far phase. Uh, within personal space, the oral and visual powers of perception are further heightened, so we could hear a whisper or we could see fine facial details like, um, like a freckle or an eyelash. And we're able to read much finer distinctions of emotions in each other's faces and body language. Uh, in this zone, olfaction comes into play as well as kinesthesia. We can smell someone's perfume, uh, we can reach out and touch someone or be touched. Our vision is really acute at the far edge and begins to distort at the near edge of personal space. Um, within the close phase of personal space, Paul notes, the kinesthetic, the kinesthetic sense of closeness derives in part from the possibilities present in regard to what each participant can do to the other one with his extremities. At this distance, one can hold or grasp the other person. Interestingly, it's the possibility rather than the actuality of closeness that defines the close phase of personal space. Um, the frisson of the almost, but not quite intimate. And the flip side of this frisson is, of course, tension and anxiety, a mutual fear. Um, Paul identifies 12 feet as the amount of space needed for an alert subject to take defensive or evasive action if threatened. So that's where I put the fight freeze threshold. Um, so if a performer crosses the 12 foot threshold, the nearest point of public distance, the audience are more likely to freeze if approached further. <laughs> um, if they're outside, they may just leave. <laughs> So a performer who comes into the social or personal space of the audience may engender feelings of closeness and contact, but their nearness may also cause fear and or a feeling that there is no escape. Um, different types of venues and festivals, of course, have their own sort of unwritten codes and expectations about relationships between performers and audience members. So a Donmar audience member, for example, might be close enough to see Jude Law's dirty fingernails without feeling any particular anxiety that the performers will try and interact with them. Uh, but you're, if you're at the National Review of Live Art or the Fierce Festival, then you can't be so sure. Um, so this, the very center of Paul's proxemic model is the radius of intimate space that starts with our skin and extends 18 inches outward all around our bodies. So in this zone, the visual is often overloaded or distorted. Hearing is acutely focused on breathing or other low-level sounds that are inaudible from a distance and olfactory stimulation is at its peak. Haptic and thermal receptors come into play as we feel the heat from each other's bodies, the moisture from each other's breath, and or direct physical contact. In Hall's words, um, this is the distance of lovemaking and wrestling. <laughs> um, Comforting and protecting. Physical contact or the high possibility of physical involvement is uppermost in the awareness of both persons. So it's, of course, less common for theater audiences to share intimate space with performers, though as many theater scholars have pointed out, it's interesting that the audience members are often seated within personal and even intimate distances from each other. Uh, the distance isn't normally perceived as intimate or personal, but instead simply as close or crowded, uh, as humans have special defensive devices for taking the intimacy out of proximity um, in public situations like the theater or the chew. Um, situations that force them to be closer than they would naturally arrange themselves. I mean, it's pretty good here with this business class seating. But, um, <laughs> So strategies um, for erasing, for taking the intimacy out of proximity include 
um, being as immobile as possible, withdrawing upon an accidental contact, and avoiding eye contact. So for audience members seated in orthodox seats, cultural conventions serve to safeguard us from unwanted intimacy, but if a performer approaches an audience member within 18 inches, there is really no convention to shield either party from an acute awareness that they are in the zone of lovemaking and wrestling. <laughs> So what does it mean to be so close to a performer or an audience member inside a piece? If we take it as a kind of anthropological given that a performer in a piece is usually accorded a certain kind of public figure status by the audience, then how does this status change or not when performers collapse the normal proxemic boundaries between themselves and members of the audience? Um, does coming near to the audience decrease the status of the performer? Does it burst their public figure space bubble, rendering them more ordinary? Or conversely, does it decrease the status of the audience members? Do audience members have more spatial status when they remain at a distance that serves to underscore the financial relationship between the performer, worker, entertainer, and the audience, customer, patron? Uh, does moving out of public space into social, personal, and or intimate space humble the status of the performer, or the audience, or both? and coming closer, reinforce and magnify the status of the performer, or the audience, or both. To perform a show for one person at a time, for four people at a time, or for 20 people at a time, in order to be physically closer to them, um, is a humbling experience as a performer. Uh, performing multiple times a day in order to keep the audience close is definitely a labor-intensive experience rather than a star churn. Uh, for the audience, a small audience performer ratio may have the effect of elevating or promoting them to a kind of VIP status, having the performance given just for them. It may also consciously or subconsciously result in the audience downsizing their idea of the performer's status, for aren't we conditioned to think that commanding an audience of 2,000 is really more impressive than telling, telling a story to four people? If an audience is allowed within four feet of the performer, the performer status is hardly dominant by proximate standards. As a performer, sharing personal or intimate space with the audience feels like entering each other's gravitational fields. Um, if audience members are close enough to touch, if we both reach towards each other, then we as performers experience their reactions, their witnessing, as exerting a kind of pull over our performance. If they maintain eye contact, then they exert a stronger force. And we can feel ourselves calibrating to the type of energy or mood they're giving up, maybe making a performance slightly more humorous or reflective or perhaps a bit darker. Uh, normally, we experience this as a positive interplay of influences, one which gives a vibrancy to performances, making them feel less rehearsed, more authentic, more conversational. The relativity of such encounters also makes them less predictable, edgier, more fallible. Um, very occasionally, an audience member exerts a strong negative influence over a performance, um, which can feel a bit like riding out a turbulent air pocket. Um, not sure how long it's going to last, or if, in fact, you may all be going down. Um, but in our experience, this is rare. Close audiencing, in our experience, generally begets greater interest subjectivity and communitas than the not close. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts on performance and memory before turning over to Helen. Um, so as a performer, I've noticed kind of an interesting phenomena in terms of the way I remember traditional theater performances and intimate performances. So even though the, the book that we're working on at the moment is about intimate work, we've done a lot of work in regular, uh, with conventional theater seating. So over the years, I gradually realized that I remember intimate performances in significantly greater detail than theater performances. Uh, performances on stage go by in kind of a, a little bit of a blur. They leave a general impression of um, what city the performance went particularly well in. Um, but these are kind of general impressions. But in performances to small audiences, 
we retained very clear memories of the audience members, how they reacted, what they looked like, what they laughed at, uh, when they looked thoughtful. And so we also remember ourselves and what we were doing in these moments much more distinctly. And I have two ideas as to why this might be. Um, the first relates to the nature of the three different kinds of memory. So episodic memory is um, remembering events that have actually happened to you, episodes in your own life. Generic memory is memory of general knowledge, um, so things like the alphabet. And procedural memory is memory of skills and procedures that you've learned, so something like playing the violin. So our personal memories, or lack thereof, suggest to us that perhaps we experience theater performances as procedural and intimate performances as episodic. And I think this is interesting because it implies two really different cognitive states for the performer in these two types of work. So in conventional theater, we're in a, we're in a skills mode, performing something we've learned in the same way a musician performs a song. And in an intimate performance, even though we've memorized lines and rehearsed the sequence of actions, we're engaged in an experience with the audience members and remember the events in the same cognitive manner that we process episodes in our lives. So procedural modes are by nature more automatic, a kind of autopilot that's made possible by rehearsal. So it doesn't seem particularly surprising that we wouldn't remember um, really distinct differences between performances in a run or a tour of a theater show in great detail. Although with procedural memory, if you give us the first line, we could probably do the rest of the show. Um, but the thing we think is significant about the contrast in how we remember the two different types is that it suggests we experience intimate performances in a cognitive manner that's much closer to lived experience. Um, in proximate performances, we still experience what we're doing as a performance. It's choreographed and it's scripted in a way that real life isn't. But I do think we remember these through episodic memory. And the second idea I had about um, memory is that intimate performance is multi-sensory in a way that real life generally is and performing in a theater generally isn't. So theaters are by nature audiovisual, and in theaters performers are used to operating with much less sensory information than we have in real life. Um, theater lights make us really short-sighted. Sometimes we can barely see your hand in front of your face. Um, if you're mic'd, the speakers are usually <coughs> in front of you, so, so it makes you a little bit deaf to what the audience are here. Um, and the stage operates with something of a black hole kind of swallowing up in order to create. So in providing a blank slate for endless possibilities, it erases many sensory particulars. Um, and the phrase blackout is frequently used in theater, and, and I think it's worth noting that in the process of making theater spaces conducive to images that can be seen by large crowds simultaneously, we sort of black out a great deal of sensory stimulus. So intimate performances employ the haptic and the olfactory much more than conventional theaters, but the auditory and the visual also operate much differently in close proximity. They give us more information, more nuance. So from the performer's point of view, there's a much richer sensory palette to work with and a much richer field of sensory feedback to work from in terms of being able to read the experiences of our audiences. So perhaps in performing to small audiences, it's uh, the experience of, it, it is more experiential or episodic for the performer in part because they have much more sensory input which is, of course, directly related to their proximity to the audience. And that's a proximity that leads them to experience this encounter more as a lived event than as a skilled result. Um, now, what I would like you to do very much is I'm going to invite you to find a partner. It's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I do want you to find a partner just somebody here that you don't know very well. So, because we don't have a lot of space to move around, well, maybe we'll just work within our, within our blocks a little bit. So just make some sort of uh, eye contact within your sort of little islands here, and just find somebody that you don't know very well. When you feel you've made that match, you can 
come with your partner and find space for yourselves. Who's <laughs> somewhere in this room? Anywhere with your little bit of space. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you or not. Anything <laughs> Okay. Um, does everyone have a partner? Yeah, there's going to there's be a partner for everybody because Leslie's all safe. We're I'm standing by. So, so bring your partner. Bring your partner into a space. That's right, it's a beautiful private corner. <laughs> okay. Anybody have a partner? Anybody partner this? Oh, do you need a partner? Oh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, you have to go. You need to go yeah. closer. Yeah. Up. yeah. And and what I'd like you to do now is to just sort of address any uh, height disbalance that there might be. So it's like the way that it's not able to face your body and choose a position. We've got these great steps here, so if there are any steps, Very well, back there. I don't know. I think they know each other very well. Back there. I don't know. I think they know each other very well. Facing each other, about a foot apart. Okay. That's that. About a foot. Yes. So now, what I would like you to do, facing your partner, is to look, look at your partner's eyes. Just look into your partner's eyes. So just try as much as you can not to laugh or not to over blink. And just take a few deep breaths if you need to. Just allow yourself, just allow yourself to have this moment with your partner. Just try and release yourself from those sort of initial nervous impulses. Just look at your partner's eyes. So try not to stage any emotions or feel that you have to perform or convey any kind of messages. Just allow yourselves to be really present and open. Here we are on this planet, in this moment, sharing this moment in art, in life. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Just allow yourselves, just for this moment, just to be with the looking. Give yourself permission to look at your partner. And images might shift, visual phenomena might occur, and just be with it. Just give yourself permission in this moment, here and now, to just look.
Now I'm just going to ask you to reach out with your left hand and take your partner's hand. And just have that awareness of what it's like when you touch. To just be aware of what should be. And to just allow that. And to keep maintaining that eye contact between you. And now with this other physical connection. I'd just like you to close your eyes for a moment. So just close your eyes for a moment and just be aware of any physical sensations, any reactions. Just have a moment to reflect on that just for yourself. And I'd like to invite you to open your eyes and share any thoughts that you want to just a little moment to share those thoughts with your partner just now. <laughs> to try and resist the nervous impulses or staging any particular emotion. He says, the goal here is very simple, to be present and open. We happen to be here today to coincide on this strange planet and it's okay. We're here together sharing a moment in life and art together and it's a pleasure to be here with you. This seemingly simple setup belies the extraordinary complexities of what takes place. We stand and look at our partners. We look into their eyes and we let them look back at us. This act of seeing, of looking, of being seen, of being seen, seeing. Gomez Peña quips, 
Imagine if we had all our political leaders in the room doing this. We could change the world, you okay, know? And I think he's only half joking. At the beginning of the exercise, my partner and I are positioned about a foot apart, and Gomez Peña invites us to move closer. He tells us to always maintain the eye contact, to not lose sight of each other, even for an instant. We obey. Slowly we draw close closer. We redraw our own rules of looking, of seeing, of closeness. We move nearer still until we are so close that the skin of our eyeballs almost touches. Uncanny proximities, dizzying, discombobulating. The eyeball of my partner unanchors, detaches, floats free, suspended in some light little air between us. I see it as my own. I see it is my own. I look into this hanging suspended iris as if seeing myself in a camera aperture as a picture is taken over and over. And I'm still not sure whose picture it is. Yours, mine. Hours. I am immobilized, hypnotized by this, my, our, pendulum, I. We are compulsively close. We are too close. And yet it seems physically impossible for me to move away. I feel like Alice once she's entered the looking glass world. The more she tries to climb the hill in the garden, the more it eludes her, the more she focuses on it, the more she loses sight of it. It's like this with you now, trying not to lose sight of you by looking too close. And it's over. I think hours must have passed. I look at my watch and discover it's been 10 minutes. <coughs> Proximity has expanded time. Seconds into hours, me into you. I have to refocus my gaze. I have to pull myself together. But I am unraveled. Where do I end and you begin? I think of the addictiveness of this contact, this communication, of looking and being seen. And I ponder the ethics at stake in this face-to-face -face encounter. What is being demanded? By whom? There is a rich history of one-to-one -one or small audience performance that are participatory, immersive, and intimate, such as Barbara T. Smith's Feed Me, 1973, or Fiona Templeton's You, the City, 1988. And what has ignited this current desire to make and experience this type of performance. Who is driving the desire? Artist or audience? You or me? Joe Mason describes contemporary audiences keen to attend such works as yearning for genuine physical connection, a need to feel sensuously and imaginatively alive. She argues that audience responses to immersive, intimate works reflect a genuine wish to make human contact, often with another human as much as with the work itself, an enthusiasm for undergoing experiences that both replace and accentuate the lived existence of the everyday world. Within these close encounters, what lets someone in and what keeps them at a distance? We are so good at navigating close encounters, jammed against each other on the tube every day, experts at keeping others shut out of our compressed but still personal space, deftly pulling the shutter of that already compressed space closer, sealing ourselves off, retreating within. And yet, come closer still, we entreat our audiences. And I think of the fleeting moments of contact between audience and performer, the desire to look and be seen, 
The desire to pay attention and for attention to be paid. The desire to capture and still some small moment of contact. We are here together, sharing a moment in life and art. It's a pleasure to be here with you. The desire for connection, intimacy even, manifests at some level in all the work that we have made together as curious. And across all these moments of unspoken acknowledgement between performer and audience of the fleetingness of the encounter, these moments of connection, transitory as they are, as indeed they must be, are perhaps enough in themselves. Ultimately, for us, there's something implicitly political in small audience work that pays attention to the individual, that focuses on the epic in the everyday, the extraordinary in the ordinary. Proximate performances function on a political level in terms of form, in their commitment to paying attention to face-to-face -face encounters, and in the physical labor it takes to perform such works, labors of love. This relationship, our closer, is marked out before our encounter. Without you here, I write the things I want to say to you. I imagine how I will say them. I imagine you with me. I imagine the qualities of the what and the how of our face-to-face. -face. I am looking for something in this encounter. I am looking for the give and take of it. What do I take away from our close-up when I remove myself back to the stage, me in the light, you in the dark? What trace of our encounter lingers and becomes part of me and how I perform? What lingers for you in how you let yourself watch, listen? How do we hold on to a sense of the shift in our relationship as audience and performer? And how do we carry that with us into future encounters? This close-up presents itself before you already, always already shaping the text I write, altering its rhythm. I already hear how it might sound, sense how it might feel. And in this encounter, what should I call you? Accomplice, companion, Ishmael. From spectator to emancipated spectator, from attendant to guest, from participant to recipient. All these namings move closer to encompass an active, fully censored involvement. I find myself tethered to the prosaic moniker, audience member. But in my head, I whisper, you. I'm sitting behind the two-way mirror in 20 CDS. You are in the other side. I strike a match, and suddenly caught in the mirror, the reflection of your face dissolved on mine. My eyes are yours, your mouth on mine. Vina Amoris, 1999. I am in a stranger's bed in Hackney, in Shanghai, in Brazil, in New York, in Nice, on the Upper West Side, in New York City, in Tower Hamlet. You are there. Right next to me, on the same 2003. We are in a life raft, huddled close. You hold a tiny projection of me in the palm of your hand. You dance with me to Elvis singing, I can't help falling in love with you. And we balance an apple between our foreheads. The moment I saw you, I knew I could love you, 2009. I am standing at the ocean's edge at sunrise, waiting for you. You are a mile away, maybe more, walking towards me. And then, suddenly, we are at the water's edge together, out of water, 2012. It is you that makes me return, still to return again and again, hundreds of times, performances later, to continue exploring the distance between us, the how close, and the too close, and the not close enough. And I want to keep meeting you in this realm of performance, in its dark shadows, at its invisible borders, within its strange interiors and its sharp edges, 
in close-up and in long shot, in shifting proximities and curious encounters. you guys. We're going to take a little break and um, pass out some wine, and then we'll have a conversation with these guys. Yeah? And thank you for Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs>
Thanks, you guys, for fantastic uh, talks and for getting us up and moving. That's maybe, I don't know, it's a first in my London Theater Seminar going, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, I think we're happy to kind of have a discussion, more of a discussion, but if you want to ask questions or comments or, you know, pick, come, Or if whatever. you would like to lead a short workshop exercise. <laughs> That you make them do something, <laughs> right? <laughs> that would be fine too. So we'll just um, go ahead and take any comments or questions or anything from the audience. I just really wish to thank everybody for, for doing that contact exercise. I mean, I think it's just such a big, such a big ask in a way, you know, to come in and to do that on a Thursday evening. But I really appreciated that sort of readiness. And I personally find it so potent when I did it. I find it such a potent way. And it's so extraordinarily simple. And yet, as I say, you know, really belies the complexities within it. And I think it's, for me, it really plays out as a really nice uh, sort of image to, 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 or lens through which a lens through which to, to look at this idea of proximity and this idea of exchange and contact and communication and how proximity alters um, how we communicate what we say what is possible for us to say. Grant, uh, a question right on the, the exercise, uh, which I find very interesting and, and provocative, but what I kind of stumble across is the directive of fight the nervousness, yeah. don't do the nervousness, and and as that, that, how that shapes the actual exercise and the possible potential of that nervousness to yeah. be reflected on and actually um, engaged yeah. in um, and, and what that's about and yeah. as a, a valid emotion and exchange to have. Yeah. Um, I was just curious about how and why that, that directive is in there. Yes, I think, I, think that's a, I think that's a really important comment. And it, I think it's an interesting thing when we take this, this is an exercise from Gomez Pena, you know, that I experienced in his workshop, and the wording comes from, from the, the book, and I remember him using the wording to us, and it was very important to me to be really true to the wording of it, because I feel there's a lot of integrity, and in he's really thought through this work. Um, and I think it's about, I think you're right, I think there's so much in that moment that is who we are as humans, and it's sort of gorgeous, and yes, um, I think... There's something about, for me, there's something about permission. So it's like, I recognize that you're doing this, but please just try and let that go. So, so something in it, I think, by me, by the instruction being given, it, it sort of recognizes it and asks you to make the space for the contact. But I am agree I'm in agreement with you. I think those moments of, you know, those, those moments when we are just so sort of vulnerable like that is also sort of what it's about. So. But, but that's it. It's almost like the, the way it's performed, it's almost like a threshold moment. And yeah. Once you get through yeah. the yeah. nervousness, you'll achieve this other stage. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so the, and it reminds me, it, the, it reminds me of something that he, that Gomez Benny also does in the workshop where you're running blind and you're running towards him across this, you know, big space. 
And the moment he asks us to pay attention to is the moment between, so if I'm, if I have to ask you to run towards me, and the moment he says to pay attention to is sort of this space here, because it's what happens to the body when you, because you think, I know, I'm kind of in the sense of how far it is, you know, the rest of it, and then you get to that space there, and there's something that happens to the body that's the same kind of thing that, that happens at the moment when we look at each other, it's that moment of sort of the vulnerability to a child-like quality to it. And the, the movement, choreographic of the movement there is really beautiful and ugly and good. So I think something sort of in the same ill Yeah. Josh and then Ethan. Um, yeah, I mean, really nothing um, struck me um, in a bit of the English video that the pops are talking about on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yesterday there was a video that started popping up all over Facebook of uh, strangers kissing, kissing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about the, about the difference. I mean, clearly there are obvious differences, and you know, even with my partner, we were talking about the comfort and the safety of this, um, and we both had we both had our minds go to those that video yeah. from yesterday. Right? And so this question of what's going on, this question of the safety there, yeah. and whether where that sort of I don't want to say ethical lines, but where that line is, and whether, in fact, that's simply a version of the same exercise that's just as legitimate and just as yeah. opening yeah. in a way, or whether it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's glued to that. And, it's, and it absolutely took me back to that, to, to that workshop as well, absolutely, you know. Um, and, and, you, and you also see all of that in the video. You see the initial total discomfort, and then you see something totally, and mm. it's the whole picture is actually what makes it sort of precious as well. So, yeah, you know, the ethics of it, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not really answering you on, but uh, <laughs> I definitely, you know, I think it's very, uh, very much in, in tune with that encounter. Aoife? Thank you also for really fantastic presentations. Um, I, was, I was really struck by your description of actors adjusting for distance. I think that's a brilliant description of what acting is, actually, lots of ways it's adjusting for distance. And I wondered what kinds of adjustments take place for proximity. Um, and it occurred to me that maybe manners are one of the forms of adjustment mm -hmm. around yeah. proximity. And I just wondered whether, what kinds of intimacy do manners enable? Which seems to be a different question to one that perhaps mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. interested yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. So particularly thinking about, say, living in London, what kinds of intimacies take place through a polite conversation about weather, or a, a please and thank you, or an, an adru a formal address, rather than informal. Mm. So I don't know, I just wanted to, to sort of speculate. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, etiquette, and particularly, you know, in, in the UK, and how it, how it gives us sort of a, a, a code of behaviour that, in a sense, allows us a, you know, a, there's a beautiful safety within that, I think. I mean, in, in my own experience, in terms of performing, I don't know if this fits into manners, but I am definitely aware of those moments in, especially performing a piece like On the Scent, which is a piece to do with smell and memory, where people are invited into a house and they are this close and I am in bed, you know. And to do that in, um, in lots of different places in the world, so you're getting lots of different types of mannered or responses of what's the right thing to do when you're that close to somebody and they're in bed. And I was absolutely aware of in that moment to moment being true to the performance, but also trying to um, gauge uh, the, the most effective, the most potent way of being. And also, like when people came into the performance completely, completely off their heads, drunk, you know, <laughs> impolite, um, also knowing that how, trying to create order through that proximity through the performance, how, you, how I would back off in that moment, you know, and how the performance, in a sense, allowing the performance to rein them in, but performing in a completely different way that I would have performed to the people who were in the room, you know, in the performance before. And so, very interesting, those, those little choices that you're making in that moment to do with um, uh, safety, comfort, discomfort, mine and theirs. Mm. It's reminding me of the same, in the same piece, I'm in the kitchen and it's very toxic. There's a lot of cigarette smoke and aerosol and the, lo lots of sort of toxic smells. 
and I was just thinking about the manners because in, if you're performing on the stage and someone in the audience is, starts coughing and <laughs> you know you, you have to just carry on and l let them sort themselves out as best <laughs> as they can but and on the set often people in the kitchen would start coughing or their eyes watering so it was sort of a convention of manners of <laughs> offering them a glass of water or uh, whilst performing yeah, yeah. but a sort of <coughs> a feeling of hosting and that mm. you know if someone's in some kind of distress you you do mm. what a host does and mm. I remember there was one girl who I didn't know I what had happened but she was just crying and crying so I remember just offering her a cigarette. I just had an instinct that it would make her feel better. <laughs> and did it? It did. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true that when you're hosting, you know, again, back to sort of etiquette and codes of behavior, you know, that give us a sort of security, that keep us out, but keep us in at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the time, you know, I don't know whether this, if other people who are, you know, sort of perform in this way feel, but sometimes it feels like you are hosting a party, that you are having that sense of, you know, it's everybody getting what they need, you mm. know, and, and all those sort of minutiae of details that you might do to make, to make sure of that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, well, that connects um, directly with one of the resonances I had, which I wanted to push you on a bit more. You brought up labor um, quite, quite a lot, the, the labor-intensive quality of this work, and then your reference to the bumpy flight <laughs> so it triggered me thinking about the, the training of, of air um, stewards mm -hmm. and, and Arlie Hochschild's mm -hmm. the, the managed part about the commercialization of feeling and there's that bit in the book where she's describing how, how, that, how air stewards are trained in a kind of method acting approach of kind of mm -hmm. a, a treat, treat, treat your client customers as if you are hosting them in your living room to establish that kind of level of intimacy, yeah. level of yeah. comfort with yeah. them. Um, but of course there's a kind of uneasy side about yeah. making a, a parallel between intimate performance and the widespread kind of commercialization of, of intimacy from I don't know, the Starbucks people knowing you by your first name, or <laughs> the, the number of times that the pret a manger might, the, the, the kind of secret, uh, yeah. the, this, the fact that if you're working at pret a you might be visited by a, a secret kind of corporate um, uh, evaluator mm -hmm. who's kind of judging you on your friendliness, how, how mm -hmm. friendly and how, how well-mannered mm -hmm. are you. Um, so I guess I'm kind of curious about the, the parallels, distinctions you might set out between the work that you're doing and the work that other people who are producing feelings of intimacy mm -hmm. outside of the arts context. Mm -hmm. I brought one way into it, if you're inclined to go this way and in interest in it, might be thinking about teaching mm -hmm. as well, which seems mm -hmm. like another kind of domain that we all mm -hmm. sort of have stumbled into without necessarily having training <laughs> for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but which is, which is very, very much about kind of adapting to, uh, which, is a, which is, as much as it is about transmission of knowledge, is also about kind of per performing it. Mm -hmm a service and we're kind of looking yeah. for ways in which as we perform that service we might also unsettle yeah. our, our yeah. students. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 No, I think that's a great question, Darren, absolutely. I don't know that what comes into my mouth is um, <laughs> care. I mean, I feel very directed by that. I remember Bobby Baker talking about that sense of care for the audience. Um, uh, and so I, th I Feel that I feel that's very much part of what we talk about when we're making work. Even though in in the piece, the moment I saw I, you, I knew I could love you. We have an ultrasound machine, and we ask members of the audience, you know, to show us if they will have a gut reading, and therefore show to the other members of the life raft that they're sitting in with in close proximity, you know, eight of them, to show that. So with it's, I think that's an extraordinary intimate thing to do, you know, mm. um, and to give permission for. And and you and I think you constantly are navigating that with an audience because actually the the performer and the performance is incredibly vulnerable in that moment, you know. Um, so I feel I feel care. I mean, that doesn't mean that I don't think that some of the things that we ask are difficult and uncomfortable and claustrophobic. Um, but I think there is driven by a desire to communicate. Where I do not think, I think the the. Uh, I think is different to than the service industry in that sense of politeness and where 
where it's sort of where the politeness is about something else, you know, and it's not. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that it's not about care, but that's I, that's not what I think is its main drive. But that's my first. That's the first thing that comes into my head when you ask that. I think about that in terms of care. Mm. Mm. Eve. Oh. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my question is uh, um, around the idea or the concept of uh, intimacy. It, it seems to me that a lot of the time in the theatre or performance tries to stay uh, intimacy actually uh, creates distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's only intimacy that we know experience. And uh, I was wondering whether this is actually um, something that is perhaps Extremely important, and like what we always ask is how close is too close when you become too close, and then everything you know, you, you may as well be miles apart, you know. And I'm going to sort of use an, an anecdote to sort of, to, in a sense, come you know, respond to you that when we were asked to do this piece called The Moment I Say You, I Knew I Could Love You, which is for people, the audience sit in life rafts of eight people to each life raft, and there are three life rafts. Um, and in the, the festival in Australia that we were invited to needed more people to see it to make more box office. So they suggested more people and more life rafts, you know. And so then it's like, you know, how much it's so important to the piece that one, the life rafts is not negotiable, but also that audience number that, you know, it's a difference it makes to do an audit to do a performance for one person mm -hmm. than than you know, than it does to four, and the difference it makes to do it to eight people than it does to twelve. And in the end, you know, because we were being pressed, but we wanted the gig, you know, um, um, our, you know our, our producer wanted us to have the gig, and so in the end, we negotiated that we would have 12 people, and the performance was weaker for it, mm. you know, um, because it was too close, they were too close to each other, and then there's a moment where the three performers get into one of the life rafts at the same, same time, which is a beautiful uh, at the moment that I really enjoy in the piece, which I started to dread, you know, because they didn't put me in there, there was no room, everybody's feet was on everybody's legs, you know, and you, nobody could pay attention to the performance because everybody wanted to get out of there, you know. So I think it's really important, and we remember do, doing on the scent to two people, we started doing this performance about smell two people in a house, and when as often was the, you know, often was the case, somebody, you know, with your audience, not everybody could show up all the time, so sometimes it would just be one person, you know, if their other half didn't show up. And the sound of that closeness in that, for that piece, is deafening, and nobody, there's no room to breathe, let alone smell and r you remember. And yet four was the perfect number, mm. like yes to the house, if you wouldn't say anything about that. I guess I would just say that in, in designing or thinking around different pieces, it's usually the content of the piece that ends up determining the form. So, um, so like the the piece that we're doing in Chelsea Theatre at the end of the month is for conventionally seated audience, and that wasn't because we wanted it to be not intimate or at a distance. It's and uh, it's because that seemed the best form for the piece, mm -hmm. or, or in some of the works that we've done where people are closer to us, it wasn't because we wanted to do a piece about intimacy per se, but uh, in on the scent, it was about smell and memory. So it really works to have people close to you, and it doesn't work in a theater audience. So, so but I think part of what we're talking about in, in looking at the proxemic zones is just having done a lot of works in both formats sort of 
not having set out to do it as a research project about how distance affects intimacy uh, in a way, it's sort of after 15 or 17 years of doing both, just that we've noticed some trends around what happens when we're closer to people. Whether, and that doesn't necessarily mean the peace is more intimate, although we're talking mm -hmm. about in mm -hmm. intimate space. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean the piece might not be as intimate as a theater performance that, re you know, that has a scene or a line that really resonates with someone. Yeah, because I was going to say the, the new piece feels really intimate, even though it's in a conventional or you know, more traditional audience configuration, it still retains that sense of intimacy, I, th I think. And maybe it's due to all the thinking that you're doing about it. But. Yeah. I mean, to the National Theater, everything we do would be intimate because we're always working in black yeah. box spaces, you know, which are intimate as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, yeah it was, um, it's a slight development in theorem's point, I think. I think uh, the, the emphasis on intimacy and uh, sharing is, is that, that, that is, for me, that's the vocabulary of contemporary capitalism, which is based on. And I think that I would suggest that we possibly need less intimacy, less share. You know, I, I need to, apparently I have to share my taste in music with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, what, how where do you stand on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think you, are, although not too close. <laughs> yeah. I think again, none of the pieces are set out to like here. Let's make some intimacy, but like we often mm. find ourselves drawn to working mm. up close. Um, and like I, like I mentioned earlier, that's partly to do because there's a much richer sensory palette up close. It's, uh, in terms of, you know, one of the pieces where we're closest to people is on the scent, which we have never charged uh, a ticket for at all. So it has no relation to capitalism in that way. That's, mm. That piece was subsidized by the Arts Council. And because we ask audiences to sh uh, for a story at the end of the piece, we feel, we've always felt that we would never charge for that because <coughs> we ask people to share a story at the end and that it was important not to have any commercial exchange in the audience to that piece. So, But I, you know, I, I totally agree with you, and I find myself thinking about this, because I'm, and this is something that I'm really interested in, hearing what, what people's views are, you know, because I do see this sort of burgeoning of this intimate one. I can't stop my students doing things where they're all in it, doing stuff, participating, interactive. And I do, question, I do ask them the question, is this the best form for this, for, you know, for your content, just simple, you know? Just because we took you to see Punch Trunk, are you always going to be, you know, like this? And one of the things I think about, what is this desire? You know, what is this? And then when something like, and then what happens to some a company like Punch Trunk when it is intimacy becomes like, you know, everybody wants it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and is it which is it? Which is this sort of which you know? Can do we because we are so sort of interactive and have everything we want all the time? Um, we think that that's what our experience should be, that we can't be satiated now, you know, without that. Or is it that because we're in these, you know, because we are so much, you know, we, we're so much online, we are so much with always the interface, that we are, like Joe May, she talks about, really craving some kind of communitas human mm. connection, you know. And I don't know. I think it's kind of a bit of both. But I, I absolutely hear what I absolutely hear. What and that, uh, I was just thinking, one thing I found really interesting, being in the States where there is no public subsidy for the arts or none to speak of really, um, is this trend that I'd never heard of but seems to be popping up a lot recently of wealth, wealthy patrons commissioning private oh, performances, yeah. like commissioning a well-known performance artist to yeah. come and uh, do a piece for your birthday or <laughs> to fly up to Jackson Hole and create a bespoke piece um, for the outdoor gardens at your estate where you're going to be hosting a party of 12. <laughs> yeah. and, and music, too. A lot of, that, a lot of yes, music brain happening is in the living room. Yeah, oh. so it's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's, well, if, you, if money can buy you the intimacy that you can get. <laughs> Did you have a question back there? Yeah, I was uh, thinking about whether intimacy is not only about the distance between the audience and the performer, but also about uh, storytelling and the story that you carry. Your stories often talks about childhood or love stories or relationship with relatives or parents. So there's a, some kind of honesty and some kind of you know autobiographical information that whether it's fiction or not, 
that you are leading towards the audience that okay, this could be your story too. So when you are addressing audiences, you, it becomes like this mind that only the dual written piece also becomes some part of it I can relate to. So I was curious about when you talk about proximity, in terms of intimacy, does it also relate to the contents of intimacy? If so, then what's your thinking mm -hmm. about what is an intimate story in curious things? Well, I'm, ha I'm like reviewing all the files and different things <laughs> in my mind. I think sometimes we tell more intimate stories on the stage where we're further away than we do when we're close up. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's all about what lets people in and what, and what keeps them out, you know, and how can the personal connect with the universal and how can it actually keep somebody out. And I feel I'm always in the process of negotiation with that, you know. I don't feel I have a definitive answer about it. I do feel I'm looking for that. And I do feel, you know, like Leslie says, you know, it's interesting. When, also, when do you make the decision to, to have that? When, when is it a one-to-one? -one? When is it not? Mm. You know, when is it? And, and some of the things we've tried to do before have been, can you have a one-to-one -one moment within a you know, regular bums-on-seats audience? You know, can you make that shift? How do you do that? Is it just too time-intensive for all the rest of the audience? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But I, it's a, I think it's always a question, Tay, that I keep coming back to. But... In always, what can I? What am I saying that keeps lets somebody into me, or is it you know too much? Yeah, again, it's that thing of how close is too close. But yeah, Joe. Yeah. Um, thank you both. Um, in the stories you were telling in the presentation, the, the configuration, and which were both um, largely offering was a face-to-face -face configuration. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask about other configurations, particularly um, the being along the side configuration. Mm -hmm. So even as like I'm having us you know, with a partner here, in, in a social situation, you go know, you know, so you don't get face to face, but when you're working with somebody, you tend to be alongside, yeah. facing mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. or, the, or, the, or, the, or the configuration of the duo, who haven't mm -hmm. worked together or performed together. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of like um, musical performance. If you're you know, performing at home, you might yeah. look at each other, but then to perform for others is to be beside. Yeah. And, and to be beside, this is where we're setting in this room. Is, is, yeah. a, is a different yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And I wonder if you just might say something about that different yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 No, that's great. I mean, in terms of an audience performer, I think we're rarely beside mm -hmm. the audience. Mm -hmm. We are usually looking at them, mm. wh whether we're close or far. I suppose, I mean, for me, it's not, exact, it's not exactly side by side, but I suppose I was always looking for that possibility of the visceral within the virtual, you know, so I'm always looking for, you know, it doesn't have to, I don't have to be seeing you, but I need to feel some proximity with you. So I think for me, uh, sort of I've always been interested in how you know, digital technology can, can, can so not having a face-to-face -face in any way, you know, how that can actually engender a really visceral and uh, sensing of really sort of proxemic relationship. So, um, and I'm, I'm always interested, I can maintain an interest in that relationship that I think may not be the, more the, not side by side, but more side by side by side. But, but it's some, something of that, the, the idea of the, uh, like, how, how can you find intimacy actually through not being anywhere near somebody? And I think one of the most intimate pieces I think one of the most interesting pieces we've ever done is a piece called Vina and Morris, which happens on a mobile phone where there's, ne there's never really a moment. There's one moment at the end when there is a face-to-face -face moment, but it's always, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's slightly side-by-side, -side, but it's, um, it's a, a presence through absence. Mm -hmm. um, so that I'm really interested in. But I'm interested in thinking more about what, what you're asking. Yeah, I think I've thought about it more in terms of audience relationships to each other, in terms yeah. of uh, going back to what Helen was saying about when does it matter that it's two people, not one, or four people, not two, mm -hmm. and sort of their side well, by side. You two as a company or two working with each other. Yeah. yeah. What about yeah. that sort of proximity of yeah. alongside? But it leads back to uh, yeah. Darren's thing about, about labor and work. Yeah, yeah. Well, it took it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we both come from solo backgrounds, and it took us. It took us. I don't know. Well, it took me. Maybe you got onto it faster, but it took me about ten years to notice that in our performances, we never 
talk to each other. We don't do dialogue. We're always talking to the audience. Mm. So mm -hmm. we're always, it's always direct address. And yeah. we've never done dialogue. So either, so maybe it's a, a failing or a shortcoming, or it, it's just how we think about audiences um, that, uh, that maybe because we're not playing characters. We've never done a convention of we're having a conversation and we don't know you're there, but you're listening to our conversation. Uh, it's, we've mm. always, I don't know, it's just how we write. It's always, we're, we're talking mm. to you. So our side by sideness sometimes is, uh, I think, is kind of peculiar <laughs> in that it's, it's not a, uh, maybe that is side by side yeah. instead of face to face yeah. because yeah, yeah. we aren't mm -hmm. dialoguing with each other yeah. or we're in different rooms or we're in different boats or we're in <laughs> different shows. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, or we're absolutely. in double bills, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Now I'm just riveted by the idea that we're constantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all um, the time. I yeah. think actually. Yeah. And that what that might what that might enable, do you know, what that might enable that it is that it's that to be to be able to do this with an audience. We and the work that we're making has to be like that, like this, and mm -hmm. we, you know, it's like how do you I. How do you write a book together? How do you make a performance together? Do you, how do you make an autobiographical performance together? You know, <laughs> so in, you know, really I interesting. And I, you know, I'm liking the side by side thing yeah. as well, Joe, because I'm thinking of it in terms of collaboration, which we all know is just like at the cut and thrust of it all when making work. And I'm thinking because of the um, the work that we've done to do with the senses, to do with uh, the enteric nervous system, we have worked collaboratively, and I think side by side with. Um, biological sciences and and how that finds its way into the work and that sense of, because when I think of it now I, I, I can, I can sort of visualize it like that. So. I think it's the title of the yeah. next show. Side, Side by Five. <laughs> Mike Sounds Hall. like a musical. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I, I think there are heaven moments in some of your work where, there, where, where you were side by side with audience. Yeah. The phrase you were saying earlier was shoulder to shoulder, yeah. which has a different that's not the business class framing a side-by-side, yeah. side. that's like working together. That's the labor I'm, side. I'm thinking about some of the moments in the lifeboats in the um, when I saw you, and then some of the moments on the beach with the road. Mm. Yeah. We're really yeah. doing things together, and that, 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 I don't know, that, that connects to my question, which is sort of about, um, earlier when you were talking about, you know, it was Pena and, and workshops, I was thinking about the difference between training performers or artists and training civilians or spectators or audience no. members. Um, and then I thought I was going to ask a question about, do you think that there are moments in your pieces where early on, perhaps, audiences are trained into the kind of intimacy that the piece is going to require? But then I decided that I'd rather ask a question. Uh, so I really appreciate us all being pushed to think about the relationship of intimacy or art to capitalism and the capitalism of capitalism. Um, I, I guess my probably kind of naive or romantic thinking is about that it seems like one of the um, interesting things about this project is that you're treating the experience of a performer as not just interesting in terms of sort of performer training or some kind of celebrity performance history, right? But that the, the experience of the performer actually tells us something about the experience of audiences. Yeah. Yeah. And that may be true in sort of large scale theatrical mm -hmm. yeah. based combinations, but it's really hard to think about. Whereas it seems pretty clear that when you're um, more or less alone performer, that inner subjectivity is working somewhat differently. And I, I just wonder if, if, if that might be a way to think our ways out of Fred Monchere kind of um, intimacy and into something that, that is more, uh, I'll say, authentic. Yeah. Well, I am a romantic, so I'm glad that you asked that question. Yeah. So, I'm, for me, one of the most exciting things about writing the proximity book was that I really feel, in side by side again, that we wrote it with our audiences. I mean, literally, we're talking about their experiences, but we are actually. A lot of the book is audiences talking about how they felt about those, those moments, how they mm. felt ex exactly in that moment when they're balancing the apple, how they felt exactly in that moment when they're holding a projection of the performer in their hand, when they're showing their guts, when they've walked to you <laughs> over, over a mile over a cliff, and then they're holding your hand at the ocean's edge. You know, And these are just extraordinary, poetic, ready-for-it, um, generous, uh, generative, as well, I think they absolutely feed into the work. You know, they absolutely feed into the work. So, for me, I think one of the you know this uh, great part of the, that project is that voice, those voices, you know, and how they speak to the work and speak back to the work, you know, and keep it going. I mean, in on the sense we're actually the, 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 talking to the audience is part of it, but really this thing of 
asking, just emailing audience members and saying, what was that moment like, you know? And the language that they come back with, um, it, for me, is really rich and authentic, I'm allowed to say. And interesting in terms of this conversation about intimacy and where we might be going and why do we want this and, yeah, why do we, what's driving it? And, yeah. I think we, it would be useful to unpick the distinction between intimacy and proximity. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. A long, long, long time ago, I was working professionally in uh, developing really emotionally intimate performance. And we were even able to design the auditorium. And the initial results we got when we started to stay there very interesting and, and unsettling. Uh, we were told the audience don't like it. They're embarrassed. <laughs> and the person I suppose was saying, I, it's too embarrassing. It's like watching somebody doing something real and secret. We had not, well, we weren't, it wasn't one-to-one, -one, people weren't looking to people. It was a very conventional staging, but. And in fact, when we moved to a slightly more normal way of acting, naturalistic acting, which is of course full of signs and symbols and it's totally realistic. People relaxed and moved mm. in emotionally mm -hmm. and became infinitely more intimately connected with the narratives, the emotional narratives that we were exploring. And it's right that this is very different from one of the most proxemic performances I know, which is when you go into a room alone with a naked hero arrival and you realize that you are expected to cut her. Mm. Now, you couldn't be closer. She's naked. She's actually sitting on you. You can see the pores in her skin. You can smell her. And a naked cure of her smells absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but intimacy, the negotiation is tentative, unfinished, ignorant, unknowing. It, it's like lovemaking of the clumsiest but most delicate kind. If you look at the dialogue, it's, it's is this all right? Uh, here, can I do this? And Kira said that one of the things that distinguishes people who go into that performance, one thing is the people who ask her if they can cut her. Mm -hmm. And the people who just assume that the performance structure gives her gives them the permission, mm -hmm. and she she finds them then on a, a great difference in the relationship between her and that particular person. Mm -hmm. And I I think she said that she doesn't yes. think of that as an intimate she doesn't call exactly. it performance or call it. I'm totally close, but what do we do? Yeah, I, I'm hands off. I don't touch. Yeah. Well, I was glad you brought up the distinction because uh, it, it was really, it's been really interesting to me that so many of the questions are about intimacy because mm -hmm. I didn't think I talked about intimacy at all in my half. I thought I talked about proximity and intimacy in terms of the senses and where, where different senses are most active. Although I think uh, then Helen's exercise and some of what you did was more about intimacy. Do you want to respond now? Um, the, the thing that, uh, reflecting further on the range of material that you've discussed and the example of Kira Riley in particular, and the, and the coupling of proximity and intimacy uh, makes me think that what for me, what I'm getting out of this conversation that's really of value is the way that the work that you are making or Kira is making is sort of undoing kind of binaries of, for example, public and private or far and close, the way that there's a spectrum or the way that you might find closeness in, in, in distance and, and those sort of things, which feels to me like perhaps an answer to the, a response to the question I was asking about what sets this apart from service economies, which are founded on a, a, an assumed kind of difference between private ownership and public space and, um, and even, even notions of, of ownership. Um, 
it's definitely something I got out of tremendous value out of the workshops with the autobiology, the sense that mm. my my notion of what myself was yeah. was um, was was multivalent. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. just the thinking, rationalizing yeah. self, but was the things that happened yeah. before I was born and the histories of you know of my genetic history and all of those sort of things. Um, so it makes me think that yeah, what's uh, What's what's getting destabilized might be the sense in which this is you know something that I can an ex even an experience that I can own because mm -hmm. one of the things I might walk away with with is um, a somewhat unsettled notion yeah. of yeah. of the I. Yes, absolutely, that's, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's that speaks point. as well to yeah. the, to the, the the performance being this this one thing, this self yeah. the notion of a one self that is the performing self but has two bodies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. But I think I think that's yeah. the yeah, the, the your your knowledge about the configuration and attenuation and adjustment, all these kind of words that have been yeah. coming up kind of are, are kind of clues I think into the um, into the, the kind of multifaceted notions of yeah. things. Absolutely. Absolutely, I find that really valuable. And the thing about intimacy keeps coming round and round and, you know, caressing me on the back of the neck and going out of the room again, you know. I, there's this moment in On the Scent where Lois Weaver sniffs the audience member and she goes up really close and she put, buries her nose in their neck, you know, and takes this big breath, you know, and it's like you're talking about Kira, you know. I mean, there's, like, sometimes a sniff is more intimate than a kiss. You know, so it's redefining what it what it is. What we mean, what is an intimate act? You know, mm -hmm. and what can surprise mm -hmm. us as well by that. And again, that thing of manners, I think, comes into it. You know, what's it? You know, what's it? What's what's sort of expected, and what suddenly dives under the surface, and yeah, and, uh, and unsettles us. Did you? I found you um, an expression: the unsettling of the eye. I think that's yeah. really beautiful um, in terms of what happens in intimacy, or what can happen. That kind of shaking, or who am I? Or Shifting and while you were talking, I was uh, my eye was drawn to that portrait up there, <laughs> and I was struck by um, thinking this is this could also be incredibly close. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about that which is so potent. Mm -hmm. It could sort of be like right here, it's like in my brain or something, depending on you know what we're doing here or why this person is there or who he is in relation to maybe who we, who the people might be and who might be in this room, and that that could be extraordinarily close be that intimate or box, box in it, in my box. Um, so thinking something about historically and then you is in relation to your manners, conventions, you know, is that close or is having somebody in front of me close? Um, and I was thinking of people reading stories and how close and intimate you can be in a character in a story, somebody you never see and you never know will meet because it's only a fictional mm -hmm. character, but it might be also very intimate. Mm -hmm. you know, so, mm -hmm. so in terms of one's depending on what one responds to, what unsettles one. Mm -hmm. so. I think it can also be a question of context, you know, how close you, how close it's normal to be in a certain context. So some of, some of the work we're talking about where we're close to people is in a context where it's normal to be that close. So on the scent is in a house. It's normal to be this close to someone in a house, in a kitchen. That's, whereas in a theater, that's, less normal for a performer and an audience member to be this close. Mm -hmm. um, or in the, in the other piece Helen was talking about, the audience are in life rafts, so it's a way of them being close, but it in, initially it gives them, you know, I was talking about the, the defenses we have for s public situations that force us closer than we would normally be, like the tube or something. So the audience have all of those things to fall back on, where they are close, but audiences know how to behave when they're you know, people know how to how to behave, and when they're in the tube or in a, you know, so, and then, but because they are already closer, it, I think, opens out some possibilities of what could happen because those defenses come down a little bit sometimes. Did you guys? Is there a question? Maybe. And then I'll come to you. Sorry, I've got the. This is not a great space for um, well, exactly <laughs> intimacy. What I was yeah. To say is because this layout of this room, yeah. kind of, it, it's referring to what someone else said earlier, it makes me think about angles, mm -hmm. because because I'm over here, I, I feel like I'm not in vicinity with you at all, even though I'm technically in the first row, yeah. so I was wondering how that, yeah. 
kind of your experiences or your research and also maybe something about layouts of rooms or spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this room it's really fixed. Yeah. 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 Compared to other rooms, you might give a talk or teach it, and very where formal, where you too, can, you know? where you can <laughs> sort of yeah. reconfigure. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to. It's hard. I, mean, I think you know, in, in trying to create a, a conversation, it's really difficult because you know we can't really see, we can't also see everybody in the space, and there's a lack of intimacy because of that as well. So I think it's really interesting considering yeah, yeah. what this room yeah, is yeah. meant yeah. for. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> no, when I came in, because I knew that I wanted everybody to, you know, come. I wanted to get everybody to come together, and I was thinking, well, maybe I would do that by us moving through the space and finding a partner. And I was thinking, what space? <laughs> you know. But then I sort of loved the fact that you know we made it work. You know, yeah. so I, you know, it's like I like that adaptability of us yeah. to make communication and contact. If we want to, we will do it. You know, despite these odd angles and you know lack of space that we've got. But yeah, and sort of barriers yeah. in front of each. Yeah, which I mean are clearly. I think in, it's intended to be structured this way f for a reason. I mean, I, th I find it a fascinating room. We're in, we've been in it a, a bunch of times, and each time it feels like, how can we challenge this space a little bit? So yeah. thank you guys for doing that a little bit. But obviously, we're still having a hard time. <laughs> so behind the projector also, and there was a question, right? Um, I, just, um, I just want to say that the, the thing that we're looking at each other and thinking about more than power relations yeah. in the sense of to me to force someone to keep looking at you yeah. feels quite dominating yeah. Yeah. Mm. and people lower their eyes when they're yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's probably a little bit to do with intimacy you know, also. yeah yeah, I mean, I think the thing that we have just we haven't even touched on is that ethical question about the face to face and that, in the Gomez Peña workshop, he absolutely develops that exercise into a complete power play exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, really, how do you use the gaze to, and work with status and what, again, sort of comes to the surface. So I think it's another reason I think it's so potent, again, so simple, but absolutely all of that is there, you know. I, I have a question that I'm just sort of really getting to ask, which is, I would love to know what other people... Why other people think this? I would call it, you know, the recent over the last ten years, um, and but sort of but particularly in the UK, but uh, that the sort of burgeoning of small audience one-to-one -one performance. What is it? What's driving the desire? You know, artist audience. Uh, is it to do with finance? You know, what, what is driving? What I'd love to know what people think about that work. That why? I have why? Away from. Yeah. Economy and yeah. things like that. I, I I see remarkable um, similarities with sales oh. and inter interconnectivity. And the yeah. one that hasn't been really said is um, subjectivity. Subjectivity, sorry, I'm tripping over my yeah. now. But the idea of intimacy. A lot of what you talked about calls upon intersubjectivity and not connecting and, yeah. and experiencing yeah. the other through the self. Yeah. And the idea of channeling spirits in a small, intimate setting, there yeah. seems to be a lot of parallels. And going back to anthropology and yeah. human traditions and stuff, I, I'm, I'm curious about those type of connections that are being sought for and the similarities yeah. between yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I've written that down. Seance. I mean, this, this, this room. I feel <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a channeling. Maybe we could wor work on that at Stanford because Jane Stanford was big into seances, so Actually, there may be some energy there we can really? work with. Yeah, yeah. yeah she was. She was talking to the spirits. Yeah, <laughs> the rise in, in one part forms. Yeah. I'm thinking about Rachel Zerahan's yeah. piece, but the, and I saw her do a, a seminar, uh, Queen Mary, and but the language she was using was therapy, was therapeutic, mm -hmm. had very little critical distance at all. It was all about how she felt healed, mm -hmm. healed and it was all about healing and harmony. I, I, and I wonder if, you know, that could be a, could be a wider sort of, you know, again, the uh, narcissism of late capitalism, the individualism, that it's, it, people think they, you know, they, it needs to be a therapeutic experience, ex experiencing art rather than something. Because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about your term, you used the word spectator uh, yeah, earlier, and I'm worried, I think about, again, 
don't you like? And if everybody's a participant, nobody's watching what's going on. And that's if everybody has the. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Join in, yeah. Well, well, I think Belgium have one to go to really um, challenging this kind of ruse of care. I think yeah. that. Um, uh, not that I'm saying that your work is this, you know, this illusion of care, because I think you're yeah, very, very sure. careful about it, but um, uh, it, it feels that it is a form that does need to, I think, be disrupted, yeah. and um, perhaps a space for interruption yeah. and accident maybe needs to be thought about, because yeah. um, I guess with the, the difference of this close proximity and this sort of um, exceptionality of, yeah. of the experience, it maybe is becoming less, less exceptional. Yeah, yeah. Um, does that sort of but for me, anyway, part of the desire as a, as a spectator and yeah. well, a participant is the, the, the risk involved. And yeah. I often feel a bit cheated when I realise that actually there was no risk to, to begin with. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a bit, very, I often feel that it's participating in this kind of uh, perpetuation uh, of, of you know, the idea that we can suddenly yeah. have a, a, a shared epiphany between yeah. uh, two yeah. people. Yeah. Um, but I find much more sort of much more responsive to work where I feel slightly more alienated to yeah. and where that sort of at least becomes apparent. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Totally fair enough. And, you know, we, we say that we call our company curious because that's what starts every project. We are curious about the world that we live in. I do not claim to have any answers. We did this all this work about gut feelings. We work with gastro... Neurogastroenterologists. <laughs> you know, Leslie was intubated. I mean, we you know, we... we we, you know, I really go there, but there, I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just, I am looking for, I am looking for a journey. Oh, um, <laughs> but you know, I'm sort of up for whatever comes, and I'm, I, in sense, in with an audience, I am offering this to them to, to, to be up for it. But I am thinking through what I am asking them to do. You know, so if I'm asking somebody in front of you know seven other people in a life raft to show me their guts. Maybe it's not a big thing for them, but I think it's a big thing. Mm. If I was asked to do that, I would think that was a big thing. So I want some quality control over that, you know. Um, and I don't think it leaves them feeling easy. From what they say back to me, it makes them feel easy, but something <laughs> happens. Something happens that is interesting in that one. And that's what I want. I want that contact and communication. And it doesn't have to be the answers. I don't have to get the answer, but I do want to have that space to tell it, and to tell it in a way that I have thought through, so I am, you know, because you can never know what's going to happen, but I am, for me, there, there is a care of thinking of, of the journey through, but it doesn't mean that the questions that I'm asking aren't difficult, complicated, sort of ugly, you know, and maybe embarrassing questions, you know. Claire, Nanny. Uh, yeah, I suppose I want to pick up on this idea of interruption and capacity. <coughs> And I'm just thinking that I suppose um, from the point you can't give the point of view of performance, but from the point of view of spectators or participants or audience members, um, maybe a kind of a, the proximate in performance can run the risk of almost kind of becoming procedural. Mm -hmm. And it needs some kind of curiosity or accident or interruption in order mm -hmm. to maintain that episodic, in order for it to affect audience members in new ways every time. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of hands. I'm going to go around the room starting with the Aoife, then there, and then there. Okay. Well, good, because I have an observation on the big question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I always want to go back to Richard Sennett when this question emerges. And I think a lot about him when it comes to the, that form of performance. Um, because there's something about what he says about cities as being places where strangers meet. And the ways in which, at the moment where this anxiety about strangers meeting, what they do when they meet. Um, and where actually manners, the codes yeah. of manners, yeah. begin to diminish this fantasy of the intimacy emerges. And it's a fantasy of an authentic self that can be somehow accessed through an encounter with the other, which seems to then become commodified as this as capitalism develops. So that since you're buying, the, you're, you're paying to experience experience. You're paying mm -hmm. to experience an encounter. Mm -hmm. But 
which appears to ameliorate a sense of alienation in, in a city, let's say, but actually might be participating in the problem yeah. in the first place. I don't know. Yeah. There's something yeah. ambiguous going on there. Yeah. That's not very coherent, but I sort of yeah. 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 Is there a component to that sort of interruption, breaking up uh, yeah. sort of cozy bits of distributing some of the political ideas about? Intimacy, proximity, the kind of closer, bit closer, bit closer, bit closer, bit closer. If that moment in it, it isn't quite procedurized and not easy. I think it came to mind was a performer called David Yan, who works in kind of rock environment <coughs> to try and get away from the build up, noise, frenzy, feeling yourself into audience, final moment. What he's taking to do is walking out of the band. Look and filling himself into the audience completely cold before the music starts. <laughs> Breaking that sort of performer rock audience boundary before the gigs even started, as if to say to people, now what? <laughs> now we can do the gig. And that seemed to break open a bit of a moment so that could have something less performer audience rock god. <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, uh, just a, just a comment um, in sort of relationship to this kind of thread that's been emerging in the conversation around a sort of skepticism mm -hmm. towards the uh, absorption of kind of connection into capital, and, um, <clears throat> and I absolutely agree that that's a, a really crucial kind of. It's important to be skeptical towards the kind of um, uh, affect of labor kind of representation, but I, I think it's also kind of important to kind of recognize that as that's been kind of developing, there's been a kind of concomitant, absolutely related kind of erosion of public service and um, care. And those kind of institutions of care and service um, in this country certainly are, as we're being kind of asked to share our tastes on Facebook, right. we're sort of the, the public is becoming less and less willing to share kind of, you know, funds and resources. <laughs> and I don't know, I think that it's important to, to kind of rem remember that, that that's kind of the material kind of consequence of yeah, yeah. this. And so it's, it's, it's complicated yeah. sort of structure. Yeah, it's a really bad. Yeah. First of all, I want to say that this woman saved on the San, San Francisco <laughs> by bringing over half the costumes out of, out of water that had been left in the UK. Oh. Yay! And in terms of in terms of capital and performance, it's it's interesting to me because um, as performers or you know artists trying to make a living, uh, one to one or intimate performance is the worst possible way you could ever make a living in terms of in terms of you know d doing a whole performance for four people is not is no business model of <laughs> how to get on. So it's I see it as sort of anti-capitalistic in comparison to theater performances where mm. you know you do you do it once to as big a crowd as you can get and then and then you can go to the pub but you know with <laughs> with smaller things you uh, sometimes we'll do eight performances a day and so mm. uh, it's like shift work it's like working a long shift and uh, so, so I don't know. Doing things like, you know, snorting chili powder <laughs> or something. How do you do that yeah. eight times but, a day? But it goes back to that thing that, you know, we were talking about in terms of sort of memory. And what, what I find interesting, and maybe it's, you know, what I'm taking, um, but what I find interesting is that doing a performance for, you know, eight times a day or 12 times a day, you know, doing a 40-minute performance, so not, not talking about a five-minute encounter, I'm talking about, you know, a kind of a good mm. lump of a show, you know, sort of 12 times a day. But what I find, what I found interesting is that every time, you know, we're in the house and on the centre and the door opens, you know, and I'm, you know, every time those four people come in and it's a new encounter, and I am interested in that. There is not sense of like, I was number eight, do you know? It's, there is definitely that thing about the encounter that I might be my own addiction, do you know? But I, I'm in, in, so that sense of it becoming sort of a, you know, formulaic or whatever, that doesn't happen, and that's one of the things that I find really interesting about yeah. it. You know? Maybe it's why it, the only the only way you can keep on doing something like that, you know, there has, you have to get off on something of it because, they, like Nancy says, there is no, you know, financially, it's not a working model at all, you know. Mm. I mean, but then I say that, I mean, maybe for 
Isn't that yeah. the, the case with their capitalism, though, where more yes, and more yes, you're absolutely. to work for nothing? Yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's true. Um, another hypothesis around this intimacy is also, I mean, what actually is intimacy at the end of the day? And I was wondering whether some of it is to do with a sense of adventure and the unknown, because that what you really, when you meet somebody and you get into intimacy, you don't actually, you get into this place of the unknown, and maybe on a deep sort of existential level that that's something that we crave, and, and we can't get in too many places and, or moments mm. of our lives, but we can get it in intimacy. And there's some kind of sentence from Lucy Rigore, which I can't remember exactly, but she says something around being with you is being in the unknown or something. Um, so, Josh? Um, turn back to Doug Wade by some way in answer to Helen's question. Um, and thinking as an American, and she doesn't take it because they're a doesn't know an American. And you guys, particularly as a sort of company who not only come from both, our, both US and UK, but have sort of really kind of like ways in which your career has made different points and what the difference, what the different notions yeah. did. Um, but I was struck by the Britishness, by the question of, of Britishness yeah. and the British. I mean, yeah. starting thinking about the punch drunk yeah. which goes to both Joe's notion of yeah. side by side yeah, yeah. in a very strong yeah. way, yeah. but also um, because of what they've done now, not only with Drunk Man um, in, in scope, yeah. but with um, doing things for Louis Vuitton yeah. and yeah. already other things that have absolutely gone into the commercial space. Yeah. And thinking about that, um, about both of these types of performances, both as immersive thinking about Joe's work, yeah. um, in relation to a particularly British immersive theater as, as it has been defined, yeah. right? Yes, it traces yeah. all yeah. sorts of antecedents that yeah. that are not yeah. British, but it's very particularly British, whereas the sort of Starbucks, and it's interesting that you bring Pret in there, because of course that's a US model that then it's rolled out, right? Despite mm -hmm. Pret. So it's interesting that the capital model, the model of capital care in the capital market is from the U.S. space, whereas it seems to me that at least in the marketing of one-to-one -one and yeah. immersive, large-scale encouragements of one-to-one -one stages to frame punch drunk yeah. or, uh, more of a punch drunk yeah. seems to be particularly pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think the fringe is so much closer to the mainstream in Britain, you know, that that fringe theater or experimental theater or, or live art has more of a comfort, at least has more potential to ripple effect into. I wonder also if it goes back to actually ethos matters. What? Not ethos matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and ethos matters. That's You're what I'm thinking. I'm thinking ethos matters. matters. Well, I, I think it as well. I think that breakdown, that absolute naughtiness. You know, mm. that, that going that going against it, you know, that, that, that some permission has been, British, yeah, to yeah. Well, I have to say thank you so much, and thank you for your work. Um, and I would really encourage you to go see the show. And if you haven't seen them before, the new show, the 26th, 27th, 28th at the Chelsea is really worth seeing. Um, I've seen previews of it. So um, I'd encourage you to come along and see that if you can. Thank you guys so much. I feel so privileged to have known these guys for so long and to have seen so much of this work. And um, I just, I, I really am, am just always moved. And I think part of it is about the kind of ideas of proximity. So at this point, I'd like to um, ask you to, to help me thank them, but then to break the public uh, space and to a private one in the pub where we can, you can get a little closer to these two, OK? Thank you so much. Can I just say really quickly before we break, thanks so much for your conversation. And the whole time I've been thinking, oh, god, we sent our proofs to the publisher yesterday and I keep thinking, oh, 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 oh. why didn't we have this conversation six months ago? But, but anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, thank thank you. Really, really thanks important. so much, you guys.